Hi friends, today I am going to talk about mechanism of action of warfaring. See what I am going to discuss. See today I am going to discuss about mechanism of action of warfaring. Friends, as you all know that warfaring is an anticoagulant drug. What it is? It is an anticoagulant drug which is derived from coumarin so warfarin is a derivative of coumarin specifically if you want to tell that it is a derivative of 4 hydroxy coumarin yes and see warfarin is sold under a brand name called as it is a derivative of coumarin it is being sold under a brand name called Cow madin. What it is? So, do you think warfarin is the only drug which is a derivative of coumarin? No. We also have some other two drugs called as dicumarol and fenprocumon. So, if anybody asks you what are the derivatives of coumarin, first of all, you must say that warfarin is a derivative of coumarin. And along with warfarin, we also have some other drugs called as dicumarol and fenproq1. So out of these three drugs, out of this warfarin, dicumarol and fenproq1, if anybody asks you which is which drug is having the best bioavailability and least side effects out of these three drugs, then the answer should be warfarin. See, warfarin is having the best bioavailability as well as it is having the least adverse side effects whenever you compare with dicumarol as well as fenprocumon. So the next point is for which indication that you are giving warfarin. See warfarin is given for which indication. Usually warfarin is given for those patients who are being developing abnormal blood clots in the deep veins and this clinical pathological situation is known as deep vein thrombosis. So it is given prophylactically as well as it is given for the treatment of deep vein thrombosis and it is also given in the treatment and prophylactic use for pulmonary embolism and it is also given for those patients who are more prone to develop strokes due to valvular diseases. So these are the some of the basic points that you must needs to know before you actually study the mechanism of action. Yes. So let, let me start this discussion. Okay. Okay. Whenever you take this drug, whenever you take this warfarin, what it is going to do is it is going to block the formation of abnormal blood clots. What it is going to do? It is going to block the formation of it is going to block the formation of abnormal blood clots abnormal blood clots or you can say that it is going to block the formation of thrombus yes but how how it is going to do that see which mechanism that this warfare in drug is going to adapt to block this abnormal formation of abnormal blood clots or thrombi. So what is this mechanism that this warfarin is adapting, that this warfarin is incorporating, that it is going to block this formation of abnormal blood clots? Yes. Today we are going to study this mechanism, entire mechanism, how it is working to block this formation of abnormal blood clot. Friends, before we actually study this mechanism, that how it is involved in doing that you must needs to know about an enzyme called vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme what it is it is called as vitamin k epoxide reductase yes so as far as this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is concerned you must know about three things first of all how it is synthesized how it is synthesized and where it is 
present nothing but its location and what is the function of this enzyme again friends i am telling that if you really want to know the mechanism of action of warfarin how it is involved in blocking this formation of thrombus then you need to understand you need to know about an enzyme called vitamin k epoxide reductase so if you really want to know about this enzyme then you must know about three questions about this enzyme that is what is how it is being synthesized and where it is present and what what is the function of this enzyme let me try to solve these three questions yes i will rub all this friends vitamin k epoxide reductase is synthesized is synthesized with the help of a gene yes each and every enzyme or each and every protein that in your body if you want to synthesize that protein or if you want to synthesize any enzyme that is present in your body then you must require a gene yes and in the same manner vitamin k epoxide reductase is synthesized with the help of a gene so actually what this gene is doing is this gene is giving instructions what it is doing it is giving instructions to your body to synthesize vitamin k epoxide reductase and as you all know that every gene gives instructions in the form of which rna in the form of mrna messenger rna so whenever this gene is uh, having an idea that i need to synthesize this enzyme then it is giving some instructions and these instructions are present in the form of messenger rna and this messenger rna is decoded or this messenger rna is translated with the help of ribosomes and whenever this messenger rna is translated with the help of ribosomes as well as with the help of transfer rna then we actually form vitamin k epoxide reductase see the question that comes here is what is this gene yes and where is this gene present see this gene is called as vitamin k epoxide reductase complex subunit 1 and it is present on the 16th chromosome it is present on 16th chromosome specifically it is present on the short arm of 16th chromosome again see i am trying to tell you what is that gene that gene is called as vitamin k epoxide reductase complex subunit 1 and where is this gene present this gene present on 16th chromosome see we are having 23 pairs of chromosomes in our body yes and out of this 23 pairs 23 chromosomes belongs to maternal side and remaining 23 chromosomes belongs to paternal side and this gene is present on the 16th pair of chromosome 16th pair of chromosome and if you want to study about chromosome as you all know that chromosome is having two different sections chromosome is having how many sections it is having two different sections the first section is called as p section and the second section is called as q section how are you going to divide these sections see these sections are divided based upon the location of narrowing based upon the location of this constriction known as centromere what it is it is known as centromere so based upon the location of narrowing or constriction or centromere we are dividing the chromosomes into two sections one is p section and other one is q section so if you if you wants to uh, see the length of this p section it is very short when compared to the q so this p section is also known as short arm and this q section is also known as long arm so as far as the gene for vitamin k epoxide reductase complex subunit 1 is concerned it is present on the 16th pair of chromosome specifically it is present on the short arm of 16th chromosome yes see you are you might be assuming that why i am discussing all this because yes as you all know that depending upon the gene polymorphism the dose of warfarin is going to vary see different people are having different genetic polymorphisms see if this individual is having this genetic polymorphism for example you consider if that uh, 
we are having two individuals if the first individual is having a, a specialized a genetic polymorphism then the dose that you needs to give to that individual as far as the warfarin is concerned is going to decrease and if you take second individual and this individual is having a different genetic polymorphism then the dose that you must needs to give to that individual is going to increase because this gene or this genetic polymorphisms of that gene is going to decide the susceptibility of this enzyme called vitamin k epoxide reductase the susceptibility of this enzyme to get inhibited by warfarin yes uh, i'm going to explain this point as i move forward yes you just assume that vitamin k epoxide reductase is present on 16th pair of chromosome specifically it is present on the short arm or the p section of 16th chromosome yes this is uh, the information as far as the gene of vitamin k epoxide reductase is concerned yes. let me discuss some other questions where it is present yes you are telling that vitamin k epoxide reductase complex subunit 1 gene present on 16th chromosome but where is this enzyme is present see this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme or this protein is present in hepatocyte where it is present it is present in hepatocytes if you want to tell specifically it is present in or it is present as integral membrane protein it is present as integral membrane protein in the cellular structure of hepatocytes in the cellular structure of hepatocyte so another question comes is what is this cellular structure see this cellular structure is called as endoplasmic reticulum what it is it is called as endoplasmic reticulum again see vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is present in hepatocytes specifically it is present as the integral membrane protein in the cellular structure of hepatocytes and this cellular structure is called as endoplasmic reticulum so the thing that you need to understand here as far as this question is concerned as far as the location of vitamin k epoxide reductase is concerned how this vitamin k epoxide reductase is present as integral membrane protein in the cellular structure of endoplasmic reticulum i mean i mean that what is the membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme as the integral membrane protein in the cellular structure of endoplasmic reticulum so we need to understand about the membrane topology of what it is it is called membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme as the integral membrane protein in the cellular structure of hepatocyte let's start to study about the membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase yes so what i want to do is i will rub all this and after doing that i will take the endoplasmic reticulum and i will discuss the membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase yes you need to understand this membrane topology see that each and every point that i'm going to discuss currently it's not just you find it's an extra information but rather it is more related to warfarin i'm going to discuss that you just assume that each and everything is having specific relationship so friends let's start to discuss about the membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase what it is membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase yes friends the reason behind in learning this membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is that to know that how this enzyme is actually spanning the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum which is present in your hepatocyte again see uh, what i what i wants to tell you is see if you if you really wants to know how this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is present 
at the level of endoplasmic reticulum you must need to study about this membrane topological nature so once you study this membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme you can tell that you can assume that how this enzyme is actually being orientated or is actually being spanning at the level of the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum yes let's try to know that how this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is spanning the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum see for this purpose what i want to do is this is my hepatocyte that i want to separate out and here we are having a very special uh, important cellular structure called endoplasmic reticulum see the endoplasmic reticulum is important in protein processing as well as it is important in protein transport and this is the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum and now we must know that how this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is actually being oriented is actually being spanning at the level of this membrane of endoplasmic reticulum let's do that yes so here we are having the amino end of vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme and this amino end is present within the endoplasmic reticulum and after forming this amino end what happens is this amino acid chain is moving through the membrane see if you see here if you see here this is the membrane and after forming this amino acid end by this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme what it will do is it tries to cross or it tries to move through this membrane of endoplasmic reticulum see whenever it is crossing or whenever it is moving forward through this membrane there is a very special type of nature is adapted by this vitamin k epoxide reductase amino acid chain let's see what is happening in the membrane so i will zoom on this membrane this is the membrane and here we are forming the amino end of this enzyme see after forming this amino end it will crosses or it will penetrates through the membrane see during this penetration what it will do is it will form an helical structure it will form an helical structure so this helical structure is called as transmembrane helix what it is this helical structure is called as transmembrane helix what do you mean by helix see helix refers to that see helix is actually used whenever you are referring to the twisting nature of any amino acid whenever you are referring to the twisting or the curving twisting or curving nature of any amino acid so here the amino acid chain whenever it is crossing through the membrane this amino acid chain undergoes into an helical structure or it turns into a spring like structure so due to this nature we call this as transmembrane helix so once it forms a transmembrane helix it comes outwards here it comes outwards into the cytosol of hepatocyte and once it is present in the cytosol of hepatocyte again it will go inside into the membrane of this endoplasmic reticulum by forming another transmembrane helix by forming another transmembrane helix and we call this transmembrane helix as second transmembrane helix see this is the first transmembrane helix and this is the second transmembrane helix once it forms a second transmembrane helix again it goes into the endoplasmic reticulum and once it goes into the endoplasmic reticulum again it comes outward and again it crosses through the membrane to come outside of this endoplasmic reticulum so during this process again it forms another helical structure this is called as third transmembrane helix so once it forms the first transmembrane helix second transmembrane helix and third transmembrane helix now it ends its amino acid chain and it gives the amino acid chain the end of the amino acid chain as carboxyl end see up to now what i have been telling is i have been telling the membrane topology of vitamin k epoxide reductase so 
See this membrane topology of vitamin K epoxide reductase describes how this vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme is actually spanning the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum. See if you are looking this spanning nature what happens is it forms the amino end in the endoplasmic reticulum and it forms a carboxyl end outside to this endoplasmic reticulum. So during this amino end in between this amino end and carboxyl end we find three transmembrane helixes which are formed within the membrane. So out of these three transmembrane helix see this transmembrane helix called third transmembrane helix is most important because it is involved in catalytic activity what it is it is involved in catalytic activity so without this third transmembrane helix you are not going to see the functionality of this enzyme so as far as the functionality as far as the catalytic activity is concerned this third transmembrane helix is most important yes see here i want to put out another point that is whenever you count this amino acid chain you find a set of number of amino acids can you tell me how many number of amino acids you are going to see throughout this amino acid chain yes there is a number that usually the vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is consisting of around 163 amino acids how many amino acids 163 amino acids See why I am discussing all this. Is there any relationship with our drug called warfarin by seeing the membrane topological nature? Yes. It is having a very special relationship with this membrane topology of vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme. How? See here. So as it is having 163 amino acids, warfarin usually binds to warfarin usually binds to a very special type or a very special number of amino acid called 139th amino acid and at this level the amino acid is tyrosine so warfarin whenever you give the drug called warfarin what it is going to do is it will goes through your splanchnic circulation and it reaches to the liver and it enters into the hepatocyte and it crosses the hepatocyte and enters into the cytosol after entering into the cytosol first of all it scans the it scans the membrane topology of vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme. After scanning this enzyme, it will find it will find a very special type of number of amino acid within this 163 amino acids and it will bind to that amino acid. So this special type of amino acid is called tyrosine and this tyrosine is present at 139th position. See it is not that there is only one tyrosine. See we can find many tyrosines but the special type of tyrosine which is warfarin is involved in binding to that is present at 139th amino acid. Yes. So friends whenever the warfarin binds to this 139th amino acid it is going to inhibit the catalytic activity of vitamin K epoxide reductase. So I want to tell you that what is the normal catalytic activity see usually vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme is involved in the conversion of oxidized vitamin k 2 3 epoxide into its reduced form vitamin k hydroquinone see again see what i am trying to tell you is that Whenever the warfarin comes and binds here at 139th position of vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme, it is going to block the catalytic activity of vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme. So by blocking this catalytic activity, you are going to block this conversion because usually or normally or physiologically, whenever the vitamin K epoxide reductase catalytic site is activated, it is going to cause the conversion of oxidized vitamin K23 epoxide into its reduced form vitamin K hydroquinone. But whenever you give the drug called warfarin, it is going to block this catalytic activity. If, we, if this catalytic activity is blocked, then you are going to block this conversion. Thereby, you are not going to see the enough concentrations of reduced form vitamin K hydroquinone. 
so whenever you are leading the deficiency of or whenever you are making the deficiency of reduced form vitamin k hydroquinone then you are going to block the formation of blood clot you are going to block the formation of blood clot but how how this blockage of conversion is actually leading to the blockage of formation of blood clot how this is actually happening see what is this mechanism that leads to the blockage of the formation of blood clot whenever you give the drug here you are blocking the conversion and here you are blocking the formation of blood clot how it is actually happening see if you really wants to know this what is the process that is actually happening then first of all you must know how the formation of blood clot is occurring in your body see once you understand the mechanism of the formation of blood clot then you can tell that by giving the warfarin how this mechanism is how this mechanism of the formation of blood clot is being disturbed such that it is not forming the blood clot yes first of all what i wants to do is i wants to explain about the process of formation of blood clot how the blood clot is actually being formed in your body let's do that so what i wants to do is i will rub all this and i will explain about the formation of blood clot yes friends see usually blood clot is formed as a response to an injury to your circulatory system see if you really wants to form a blood clot first of all the thing you need is you require an injury so whenever there is an injury or damage to your circulatory system then you can form a blood clot so first of all what i wants to do is i will i, I wants to separate one of my medium sized blood vessel after separating this medium sized blood vessel i will apply the injury onto this blood vessel see after applying an injury onto this blood vessel i will show you how this blood vessel forms a blood clot in response to this injury let's do that so this is my medium sized blood vessel and here i am having the endothelial cells which are being covered to this blood vessels and whenever i apply an injury to this endothelial cells what happens is this endothelial cells gets damaged and whenever this endothelial cells gets damaged what happens is it is going to expose the sub endothelial surface it is going to expose sub endothelial surface that is nothing but it is going to expose its basement membrane what it is going to do it is going to expose its basement membrane and whenever it exposes its basement membrane as you all know that basement membrane is made of collagen what it is it is made of collagen and whenever it is exposing the collagen whatever the platelets that are being circulated in your blood stream usually they are inactive but whenever they comes to the site of this injured area they suddenly becomes active they suddenly becomes active but how they are going to become active see here see once normally the platelets comes at the site of injured area what they do is they normally comes and they binds to this basement membrane so if this platelet wants to binds to this collagen or to this basement membrane then this platelets requires some special types of receptors called integrin receptors okay let me zoom on this interaction whenever this platelet wants to binds to this collagen or basement membrane then this platelet requires some special type of receptors called integrin receptors that belongs to a special type of family called cell adhesion molecules cell adhesion molecule family so whenever this platelet receptors called integrin receptors comes and binds to this collagen binds to this basement membrane this refers to a special type of a fancy name called as platelet adhesion what it is it is called platelet adhesion so like so we are having many many platelets that are coming at the site of injury and all these platelets they come and they binds to this 
collagen using their integrin receptors so i am asking you a question that can you name the integrin receptors so what are the different types of integrin receptors yes so usually in our body the platelets are having three different types of integrin receptors or three different types of cell adhesion molecules and these three different types of integrin receptors are called as glycoprotein receptors so what are the types of these glycoprotein receptors so we are having glycoprotein 1a or glycoprotein 2a this is one type and next type is glycoprotein 1c or glycoprotein 2a and the final third type of integrin receptor or the glycoprotein receptor is glycoprotein 1b or glycoprotein 1a so these are the three types of integrin receptors that these platelets are going to consisting of that these platelets are going to consisting of which helps in cell adhesion as well as which helps in cell activation see as far as the cell adhesion and activation are concerned these are most important it means these glycoprotein receptor 1a and 2a as well as 1c and 2a they can binds to the collagen they can binds to the they have a property of binding to the collagen as well as activating the platelet but whereas glycoprotein glycoprotein 1b or 1a they are having only the property of activating the platelets they are having the property of only activating the platelets but not binding to the collagen yes see let's review that what i have been telling see i have been telling that i have separated the medium sized blood vessel and i applied an injury to the medium sized blood vessel once i applied an injury there is an exposure of subendothelial surface or basement membrane whenever there is an exposure of basement membrane what happens is usually the platelets which are in active state they comes to this injured area and whenever they see this collagen with the help of these integrin receptors they comes and they binds to they comes and they can binds to this collagen after binding to this collagen we call this process or we call this whole event to be referred as platelet adhesion and i am talking about three different types of glycoprotein receptors yes up to now is it clear yes so now what i wants to tell you is once the platelet starts adhering to the adhering to this collagenous surface what happens is the platelet starts to become active what happens the platelets starts to become active once they are start adhering to this collagenous surface let's see the platelet activation okay let's see about the platelet activation so here we are having a blood vessel and here we are having an injury to the blood vessel that is exposing the basement membrane and now the platelets start adhering to this adhering to this what subendothelial surface or basement membrane and this is called as platelet adhesion see once the platelets adhere to this collagenous surface they becomes active they becomes active so whenever they becomes active they start to release very special type of contents which are present in the in their cytoplasm vesicles called as adp serotonin calcium ions as well as von willebrand factor again so whenever the platelets starts to become adhering to this collagenous surface they becomes activated so whenever they becomes activated they start to exocytose they start to exocytose their granules that are present in their cytoplasm and we call these granules as alpha granules as well as we call these granules as delta granules see usually the delta granules are also called as dense granules and alpha granules are also called as light granules because usually this characterization is based based upon their observement under electron microscope so usually this delta granules or the dense granules releases three types of contents one is adp serotonin as well as calcium ions and the alpha granules releases a very special type of content called von willebrand factor and all these contents what they do is they acts on other platelets that are being circulated in the blood stream and this starts to become activate those platelets that are being circulated in your 
bloodstream so whenever these platelets that are being circulated in the bloodstream they becomes when they becomes activated again they comes to here and again they binds to this initial platelet layer and again they forms a second layer of platelets and again this second layer of platelets again they becomes activated again they cause a release reaction and once they cause a release reaction these are the contents and again these contents activate some other platelets again these platelets comes and they forms a third layer so like like this manner these all these platelets they form a plug called primary platelet plug what it is it is called as primary platelet plug and it is called as primary because this primary platelet plug is not so strong to stop the hemorrhage as this plug is not so strong to stop the hemorrhage it is called as primary platelet plug see our main goal is to form a secondary hemostatic plug yes let's form the secondary hemostatic plug and this formation of secondary hemostatic plug is most important where the warfarin comes and interacts with let's do that so during this formation of secondary hemostatic plug or secondary platelet plug we require coagulation factors we require different types of coagulation factors so this is called as primary platelet plug and this primary platelet plug needs to form a secondary platelet plug yes so how it is forming the secondary platelet plug that we needs to understand that okay before i needs to before i tell you how this secondary platelet plug is formed let me tell you about or let me introduce our main players of forming this called as coagulation factors see friends see we are having different types of coagulation factors in our blood stream and all these coagulation factors are produced by the liver except coagulation factor 3 or von willebrand factor except this coagulation factors remaining all the coagulation factors are being produced by the liver so every time the liver keep on producing these coagulation factors and keep on dumping these coagulation factors into your circulatory system and normally usually in the absence of any injury to your blood vessels these coagulation factors are become inactive usually these coagulation factors are in a inactive state researchers astonish it how these coagulation factors at this injured area how they are becoming active and why not these coagulation factors are being activated at this normal endothelial surface and how they are becoming active at this injured surface researchers are very surprised and later on these researchers upon a lot of research they found that due to two reasons these coagulation factors can become active in your circulatory system see i am going to tell you about what are these two reasons so the first reason is exposure of exposure of the surface of the activated platelets exposure of the surface of activated platelets this is the first reason and the second re reason is exposure of collagen see see if you wants to form a blood clot the primary thing that needs to be occurred should be there should be an injury and this injury should leads to the exposure of collagen and whenever there is an exposure of collagen you can activate coagulation factor this is the first way of activating the coagulation factors and the second way of activating the coagulation factor is once you expose it the collagen the platelets comes and binds to this collagen by forming a primary platelet plug and once the primary platelet plug is formed you can have the exposure of you can have the exposure of surface of activated platelets again see once you expose the collagen you can bind the platelets to that collagen after binding to that platelets you can activate that platelets such that you can have the surface of activated platelets and once you form a primary platelet plug 
once you form a primary platelet plug you can have the most largest surface of the activated platelets and these largest surface of activated platelets can now activates the cascade of plate the cascade of coagulation factors the cascade of coagulation factors in a cascade manner in a cascade manner okay these are the two reasons why these coagulation factors becomes activated at the site of injury the first reason is exposure of the surface of activated platelets here we are exposing the surface of activated platelets and the second reason is exposure of the collagen so whenever these coagulation factors they come and they bind to this surface of activated platelets they can becomes activated and whenever these coagulation factors they come and they bind to this collagen again they become activated so there are two ways of activating the coagulation factors one is binding to the platelets and binding to the collagen yes why i am discussing all this is there any relationship with mechanism of action of warfarin yes see you just keep in your mind that whenever you give the warfarin whenever you give the warfarin what this drug is going to do is this is the most important point you keep the star mark to this point see whenever you give this drug warfarin see warfarin does not wants see whenever the researchers or the pharmaceutical companies are designing this drug warfarin see all the way throughout this designing process of warfarin throughout this designing see whenever these pharmaceutical companies are designing this drug called warfarin throughout this designing process there is only one thing that is keep on running in their mind that warfarin should inhibit should inhibit the binding of coagulation factors to this surface of activated platelets this is the main loophole that these pharmaceutical companies have identified that as these coagulation factors are activated due to the binding of these coagulation factors to the surface of activated platelets they have designed a beautiful drug called warfarin so as to inhibit this binding of these coagulation factors to the surface of activated platelets see the next point that i wants to tell you is as i told previously there are many coagulation factors there are many different types of coagulation factors and all these different coagulation factors if they wants to become if they wants to achieve the activation state in their life throughout their life they needs to bind to the surface of activated platelets so do you think the warfarin drug is going to interact with each and every coagulation factor binding nature no see whenever you take this drug there are only some type of coagulation factors there are only certain coagulation factors that this warfarin is going to interact such that it does not allow the binding of this coagulation factors to the surface and warfarin leaves out some coagulation factors it does not wants to touch these coagulation factors so it it wants to binds or it wants to inhibit only those coagulation factors only those certain types of coagulation factors that should not bind to this activated platelets and it does not care about the remaining coagulation factors even if they bind or even if they don't bind so i wants to tell you which types of coagulation factors that this warfarin is going to interact with is going to bind with is going to causing disturbances such that these certain coagulation factors should not bind to this platelet surface okay let's discuss about those special category of coagulation factors yes there are four different special category of coagulation factors that this drug is going to interact i will tell you those so the first coagulation factor is coagulation factor 2 the second coagulation factor is coagulation factor 7 and the next one is coagulation factor 9 as well as coagulation factor 10 these are the four coagulation factors that this drug is going to block the binding of to exposed surface of activated platelets see 
why this warfarin is choosing these four types of coagulation factors yes see usually these are the special category of coagulation factors that requires some specialized post translational modifications again these are the four different categories of coagulation factors that requires some specialized considerations during the post translational modifications so what are these considerations or what are these specialized things that they require during this post translational modifications so during this post translational modifications all these coagulation factors demand a special type of reaction called carboxylation sorry carboxylation reaction carboxylation reaction see these coagulation factors demands or they are having some specialized considerations during the process of post translational modifications and these specialized considerations known as carboxylation reactions so what i wants to do is first of all i will discuss how this carboxylation reaction is being applied to all these coagulation factors first of all we needs to study how this carboxylation reaction is being applied to all these coagulation factors this is the thing that we needs to study if you understand this carboxylation reaction how it is occurring for all these coagulation factors then you can easily point out what is the mechanism of action of warfarin see warfarin usually inhibits the binding of these coagulation factors to the exposed surface of activated platelets but how it can how it is doing that how it is inhibiting this binding nature of these coagulation factors to that surface so the actual answer lies here in this specialized consideration called carboxylation reaction so warfarin interferes with this carboxylation reaction thereby again warfarin interacts with this carboxylation reaction thereby it does not carboxylate these four types of coagulation factors by doing so it does not wants or it does not makes these coagulation factors to bind with that surface okay i will drop all this and i will explain the carboxylation reaction of coagulation factor 2 7 9 10 and how it is occurring okay friends as you all know that coagulation factors are nothing but proteins as you all know that proteins are nothing but chain of amino acids it means these coagulation factors have different types of amino acid different types of amino acid so one of the type of amino acid that these coagulation factor 2 7 9 10 they are consisting of is glutamate residues what it is one of the amino one of the important amino acid that these coagulation factors are going to consisting of is called as glutamate residues yes so usually these glutamate residues are present throughout this amino acid chain nothing but coagulation factor is a protein it is a protein nothing but it is a chain of amino acids so in the within the chain of amino acids we find glutamate residues at the different positions of this chain of amino acids but i wants to tell you the specific location of glutamate residues within the chain of this amino acid or within the chain of this protein so called coagulation factor is very important that 9 to 13 glutamate residues 9 to 13 glutamate residues that are present at the amino terminal end that present at amino terminal end is very important to participate in carboxylation reaction see coagulation factor is a protein nothing but it is a chain of amino acids and within this chain of amino acids we find different types of amino acids and out of these different types the one specialized type is glutamate residues 
and we are going to find this glutamate residues at different positions of this chain of amino acids but the important positions of these glutamate residues as far as the carboxylation reaction is concerned the important position is the positions between 9 to 13 positions which are close to the which are close to which end amino terminal end, which are close to amino terminal end. so if anybody asks you if you wants to do the carboxylation reaction for coagulation factor 2 7 9 10 which type of amino acid is most important to be associated with this carboxylation reaction if anybody asks you this question you can you should tell that glutamate residues are very important in carboxylation reaction but somebody comes and asks you a question that which number of glutamate residues within the chain of amino acid within the amino acid chain of the coagulation factor is so important if anybody asks you that which number of glutamate residues that are present within the amino acid chain of coagulation factors are most important to be associated with carboxylation reaction the answer should be 9 to 13 glutamate acid residues which are close to the amino terminal end are most important in participating in carboxylation reaction yes so now what i want to do is let's try to carboxylate this glutamic acid residues at the positions of 9 to 13 which are close to the amino terminal end yes so this is my coagulation factor either it is 2 7 9 10 and here here i'm having amino terminal end here i'm having carboxyl end so i'm selecting i'm selecting a set of amino acids called 9 10 11 12 and 13 i'm going to select this six sorry this five amino acids called glutamic glutamate residues such that i can carboxylate this glutamate residues at these positions not other positions only at these positions because the carboxylating the glutamate residues at this position is only important as far as the activation of these coagulation factors is concerned yes let's carboxylate the glutamate residues at 9 10 11 12 13 so first of all before carboxylating what i want to do is i will separate one of this amino acid out of this five glutamate residues that is I will separate ninth glutamate residue and I will try to carboxylate this ninth glutamate residue. I will try to carboxylate this ninth glutamate residue by separating out. Yes, let's do the carboxylation of ninth glutamate residue which is present close to the amino terminal end within the amino acid chain of coagulation factor 2, 7, 9, 10. Let's do that. So, I feel it's bit a very lengthier process but i want all my viewers to understand the exact the mechanism of action of warfare yes i am i am doing that let's separate this ninth here we are having ninth glutamate acid residue as you all know that as it is an amino acid it is having amino end it is having amino end and it is having which end it is having carboxyl end this is called as what it is it is called as glutamic acid and here we are having yes this is called as glutamic acid what it is glutamic acid and let's try to carboxylate this glutamic acid so whenever you carboxylate this glutamic acid So there is a very special position to carboxylate this amino acid so you don't want to carboxylate this amino acid at any position you want see our enzymes are designed in a such a manner that they carboxylate this amino acid only at a specific location by doing so they can activate or they can make this coagulation factor to be functional such that it binds to this surface 
So the enzyme that is important in carboxylating this glutamic acid residue at a very specialized position of carbon, this enzyme belongs to a class called ligases. What is this class? Ligases. So one of the important ligases that plays a role here to carboxylate this glutamic acid residue is gamma glutamyl carboxylase. What is this ligase called? This ligase is called gamma glutamyl carboxylase. Friends, if this enzyme wants to carboxylate this glutamic acid residues, then it requires raw material. So what is this raw material here? This raw material is called as carbon dioxide. What is called? Carbon dioxide. So what it will do is, this gamma glutamyl carboxylase, which is a ligase, it uses this carbon dioxide and it ligates this carbon dioxide molecule at the position of gamma. So here we are having the gamma position. Here we are having gamma position. And this gamma glutamyl carboxylase is going to ligate this carbon dioxide molecule at the gamma position by doing so it carboxylate the glutamic acid residues so let's apply this carbon dioxide molecule here so this is the carbon dioxide molecule which is ligated by this gamma glutamyl carboxylase at the position of gamma so where is beta see beta is here where is alpha so why it is called as alpha see this amino acid is also called as alpha amino acid usually not only this amino acid any amino acid which is having its functional group such as nh2 as well as cooh if these two functional groups are attached to this first carbon then that amino acid is called as alpha amino acid so the next to this alpha carbon we are having beta carb and next to this beta carbon we are having gamma carbon and this enzyme called gamma glutamyl carboxylase attaches this or ligates this carbon dioxide molecule at the gamma carbon and it forms a carboxylated molecule and this carboxylated glutamic acid molecule is called as gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues and this entire modification is being started as a part of post translational modification as a part of post translational modification and friends here i want to tell you an important point let me rub all this and even this here we are having gamma glutamyl carboxylase See, I am telling that this gamma glutamyl carboxylase is ligating the carbon dioxide at the gamma position to form gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues. Before doing that, this gamma glutamic glutamyl carboxylase needs a molecule of vitamin K. Needs a molecule of vitamin K. So now, we can understand the importance of vitamin K. See, vitamin K is derived from three different sources. One is from gut bacteria. See, we can get the vitamins K from gut bacteria. And we can synthesize vitamin K synthetically. And we can also get the vitamin K from chlorophyllous plants. So, the form of vitamin K that you are getting from the gut bacteria is called as vitamin K2. And the form of vitamin K that you are getting or that you are synthesizing is called as vitamin K3 and the form of vitamin K that you are getting from the chlorophyllous plants is called as vitamin K1. So you take any form of vitamin K, either it is K1, K2, K3, this any form of vitamin K that are currently available in our body, this any form of vitamin K needs to help to get this gamma carboxy sorry gamma glutamyl carboxylase to function normally again whenever this gamma glutamyl carboxylase wants to convert this reaction wants to forward this reaction 
it utilizes a molecule of vitamin k it takes the help of a molecule of vitamin k but which form of vitamin k or which type of vitamin k either it is vitamin k1 k2 or k3 you you select any form of vitamin k then this form of vitamin k needs to help this gamma glutamyl carboxylase yes so usually whenever this gamma glutamyl carboxylase utilizes this vitamin k molecule it converts this vitamin k molecule whenever it is being utilized it it is converted into another form and we call this form as can anyone guess this yes we call this form as oxidized vitamin k 2,3 epoxide what is this form it is this form is called as oxidized vitamin k 2,3 epoxide so if you wants to push this carboxylation reaction then we must push this oxidation reaction if you wants to push this carboxylation reaction by gamma glutamyl carboxylase then we must push this oxidation reaction we must oxidize this reduced form of vitamin k hydroquinone into oxidized vitamin k 23 epoxide so as far as the carboxylation is concerned it is dependent on oxidation so even though you are having gamma glutamyl carboxylase even though you are having carbon dioxide even though you are having vitamin k but if you don't have vitamin k then you are not going to convert this reaction then you are not going to convert this reaction so we require reduced form of vitamin k hydroquinone in a sufficient concentration in the liver so as to make this post translational modification to occur yes if you don't have the enough concentration of reduced vitamin k hydroquinone then you are not going to get the carboxylation reaction which is dependent on oxidation reaction yes so friends See. the point that all of you must understand is if you keep on making this carboxylation reaction to push forward then it keeps on depending upon reduced vitamin k hydroquinone if it is keep on depending on reduced form of vitamin k hydroquinone then it is keep on being get converted to into another form called as oxidized vitamin k 23 epoxide so at some point there is deficiency we get a deficiency of reduced vitamin k hydroquinone where due to this deficiency this carboxylation reaction can be stopped if this carboxylation reaction can be stopped then the coagulation factors 2 7 9 10 they cannot able to bind to surface of activated platelets this blocks the secondary hemostatic plug formation so usually physiologically what happens is our body does not want this concentration to go down in our hepatocyte it maintains the concentration ratio between this reduced vitamin k hydroquinone as well as oxidized vitamin k 23 epoxide but how it is going to maintain this concentration ratio now your body tells the enzyme to come into action what is that enzyme this enzyme is called as vitamin k epoxide reductase which is present as an integral membrane protein in the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum where this vitamin k epoxide reductase enzyme with the help of its catalytic site what it is going to do is it is going to cause the reduction of this enzyme usually it is an oxidized enzyme as it is a vitamin k epoxide reductase it is going to cause the reduction of this enzyme so whenever it is going to cause this reduction of enzyme again we get the normal concentration of reduced vitamin k hydroquinone see why i am discussing all this because your drug called warfarin binds to this vitamin k epoxide reductase at 139th position that is having an amino acid called tyrosine where warfarin binds here and it will blocks the catalytic activity of this enzyme whenever this catalytic activity is blocked we are going to get an imbalance between this reduced forms of vitamin k as well as oxidized forms of vitamin k due to this imbalance you are not going to have the carboxylation reaction because we get a deficiency of reduced vitamin k hydroquinone and such that this enzyme which is dependent on this 
reduce the form of vitamin K is not going to work. If it is not going to work, it is not going to ligate this carbon dioxide at the gamma position. If it is not going to ligate this carbon dioxide at this gamma position, then you are not going to get vitamin, then you are not going to get gamma carboxyglutamic acid residues. If you are not going to get gamma carboxyglutamic acid residues, then you are not going to bind to the surface of activated platelets and you are not going to form the secondary hemostatic plug. Yes, the point that you need to understand here is after seeing all these mechanisms, the point that you need to understand is why vitamin K epoxide reductase is maintaining this enzyme. We know that it is maintaining this enzyme due to this carboxylation reaction. And why this carboxylation reaction is being operated for these coagulation factors, for these certain specialized coagulation factors. And what is the need to get carboxylation reaction for these coagulation factors? Yes, there is a need because, see, I will tell you why, what is the need of carboxylation reactions? What is the need of carboxylation reaction to happen in these coagulation factors? Let's discuss the need of carboxylation reaction for the coagulation factor 2, 7, 9, 10. Yes, let me need of carboxylation reaction. Need of carboxylation reaction for coagulation factor 2, 7, 9 and 10. Yes, friends, usually these coagulation factors have some specialized points called glutamate acid see glutamate residues point glutamate residue points see our body wants certain coagulation factors to be extremely negative so the need for the carboxylation reaction is decided by our body is decided by our dna so as far as this need is concerned, our body wants certain coagulation factors such as 2, 7, 9, 10 needs to have extremely negatively charged residues within their amino acid chain. So what is the need? The need is to have, to have extremely negatively charged amino acid residues within its amino acid tail within its amino acid chain or tail so due to this requirement of having this extremely negatively charged amino acid residues at this amino acid chain our body adapts a post translational modification called carboxylation reaction so due to this carboxylation reaction we are producing gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues so these gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues within its coagulation factor 2 7 9 10 makes this coagulation factors to be extremely negative so whenever they are having extremely negative nature as you all know that negative attracts towards positivity negative attracts towards positivity so as it is having extremely negativity nature what it will do is it will tries to bind with calcium ions so whenever it binds with calcium ions then these coagulation factors by binding to this calcium ions it can bind to the surface of activated platelets again i will explain this in a very big detail see here see now i'm currently i'm telling that there is a need of carboxylation reaction for this coagulation factor what is the need the need is that we produce this coagulation factors in an extremely negative charged way so what is so here we are having coagulation factor 2 7 9 10 and all these needs to bind to the surface of activated platelets if they wants to serve if they wants to bind to the surface of activated platelets first of all they needs to undergo carboxylation reaction and whenever they have an undergone carboxylation reaction now they are having some specialized modified residues called gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues they are having gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues and whenever they have the gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues they can bind to some specialized charged particles called calcium ions whenever they bind to the calcium ions now with the help of calcium ions they can bind to the surface of activated platelets they can bind to the surface of 
activated platelets these are the platelets here we are having calcium ions and with the help of calcium ions these coagulation factors can bind to these platelets whenever the coagulation factors can bind to the platelets with the help of calcium ions they can now become gets activated they can now become gets activated so whenever they become activated they participate in coagulation reaction and whenever they participate in coagulation reaction they form a secondary hemostatic plug therefore they can form a blood clot so whenever you block the enzyme called vitamin k epoxide reductase you are going to block the reduction process if you are going to block the reduction process we are going to get the deficiency of vitamin k hydroquinone reduced forms of vitamin k hydroquinone if you are not having sufficient concentration of reduced form of vitamin k hydroquinone then you are not going to have carboxylation reaction if you are not going to have carboxylation reaction then you are not going to have the gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues that are being formed in these coagulation factors if you don't have these residues you can you are not having this ability to bind with calcium you are not having the ability to bind with calcium if you are not having the ability to bind with calcium then you are not having the ability to bind with anionic phospholipid surface of the platelets yes why do we need calcium So why do we need calcium see we need calcium such that these negatively charged extremely negatively charged gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues can bind to this negatively charged anionic see anionic or negatively charged surface phospholipid surface of activated platelets so if you are not having calcium positively charged then you are not going to bind this extremely negatively charged surface with extremely negatively charged phospholipid surface of activated platelets so because negative uh, see because negativity actually repels whereas positivity actually attracts so we are creating this positive charge so as to attract this coagulation factors to the platelets such that these coagulation factors they becomes activated and they get they get form a blood clot yes See friends, now what I want to do is, I will put all this in a process of hemostatic manner. In a process of hemostasis, I will put all this in a process of hemostasis such that you get a clear picture. This is the last and final thing. Yes. So, here we are having, this is a blood vessel. Here we are having an injury. And now you are going to form a primary platelet plug. And whenever you form a primary platelet plug, there is a need to form a secondary hemostatic plug. If you want to form a secondary hemostatic plug, then we require certain coagulation factors. We require coagulation factors. And these coagulation factors are only activated whenever they are entering into the site of injury. And once they enter into the site of injury, by binding to the collagen or by binding to the surface of activated platelets, they can now become activated. And whenever these coagulation factors becomes activated, they can form a hemostatic plug. Okay. Before I tell you that, some of the coagulation factors, out of many coagulation factors, some of the coagulation factors needs require some specialized consideration called post-translational modifications. And these post-translational modification is called as, what it is? It is called as carboxylation. So whenever you are having this carboxylation reaction, you are forming a residues called gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues. And whenever you are forming a gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues, these coagulation factor 2, 7, 9, 10, they can bind to calcium ions. And by binding to the calcium ions, they can bind to, they can bind to surface of activated platelets such that they become active. So what I want to tell you is, whenever you give the warfarin drug, Whenever you block this vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme, you are blocking this activation of these coagulation factors. And whenever you block this activation of coagulation factors, 
you are going to block the formation of you are going to block the formation of blood clot yes this is how your so called warfarin is actually involved in blocking the formation of blood clot this is the main background reason that many pharmaceutical companies throughout their designing process of this drug so called warfarin they have designed this drug in a such a manner that it directly interferes with oxidation reaction and indirectly interferes with carboxylation reaction and due to this indirectly interference with this carboxylation reaction it is indirectly interfering with the formation of gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues or extremely negatively charged residues within their coagulation factors and due to this inhibition of this formation of this gamma carboxy glutamic acid residues you are not going to find the any post translational modification at the level of this coagulation factors if you are not going to form this post translational modification in 2 7 9 10 coagulation factors then you are not going to have the calcium binding property if you are not going to have the calcium binding property we cannot bind this coagulation factors to this surface of activated platelets thereby you cannot form a blood clot this is how warfarin is preventing the blood clot formation abnormal blood clot formation in in your deep veins so this is how the warfarin works so friends uh, if you have any questions you can please comment below the section and if you like this video please share your comments and please share this video thank you